So Ian Rappaport tweeting that Dak Prescott is probably back October 30th, which means seven more games without Dak Prescott. Well, here's the good news. Bears, Lions, Washington at home. Also the New York Giants, that game's on the road. So four winnable games, three at home, Giants on the road. By the way, Daniel Jones has been a better quarterback on the road than at home. So Cooper Rush in New York to face Daniel Jones, who can't win home games. Those are four winnable games. Can you win three? You're three and five and Dak comes back. It's not a sky is falling scenario because the sky wasn't very high. This team was a wild card team at best. That was our prediction in most people's reasonable opinions. I don't know. Three and I would not leave the building to solve this. After Trey Lance's outing in Chicago, do you know how much you'd have to give up to pry Jimmy Garoppolo away from the Niners right now? <laughs> They're not giving you Jimmy. You'd have to give up a, a second round pick, maybe two seconds. Can't give that up. Cowboys need their draft picks. They got to rebuild that offensive line, rebuild that receiving core, get a pass rusher in next year's draft. They need cap space. So to me, this season's got limitations anyway with Mike McCarthy as head coach. Roll the dice, see if Kellen Moore and Cooper Rush can cook up three wins over the next seven games. There are some things in the NFL that are really hard to predict. I mean... You know, I'm watching Washington and Jacksonville yesterday. It was just a, a bit of a mess. I'm watching the Niners and the Bears and the weather and two young quarterbacks. It's a bit of a mess. The easiest thing to predict in the NFL to me was Green Bay struggling with Minnesota on the road. And, you know, this is something that Aaron Rodgers tries to give off this air of mystery. But the truth is he's the most predictable guy in the NFL is that you knew it would be an issue. Two small school rookie wide receivers opening on the road in Minnesota in the biggest stadium they've ever played in. You know, they make the mistakes that small school wide receivers would make debuting in the NFL in a division game. And he ghosted them. Aaron Rodgers did what we said all offseason long. This is what he does. He ghosts friends. He ghosts teammates. Christian Watson dropped a pass. He didn't throw his way again until the fourth quarter. <laughs> Come on, dude. You're not going to beat Justin Jefferson in Minnesota throwing to A.J. Dillon. And, and, and then the young receiver from Nevada, Romeo Dubs. There was a miscommunication early. It happens. It's loud. He played at Nevada in a small stadium, small conference, little miscommunication. And Aaron Rodgers ghosts him. And Matt LaFleur had to use both of them in reverses to get them back into the game because Aaron wouldn't throw to him. So, like, I, I know a lot of you love Aaron Rodgers, but it was so absolutely predictable. Now, offensive line play, they had some injuries. Don't make excuses. Tom Brady's offensive line was a mess. He looked good. Trubisky's was a mess. He won. Uh, Justin Fields' offensive line has been a mess for two years. He won. Yeah, Green Bay had some injuries. But Aaron Rodgers, once again, He's single. He's never had kids. You learn something when you have children. You have to understand they make a lot of mistakes. You don't ghost them. And this, this has been my thing with Aaron. Never married, no kids. He doesn't have to sacrifice much. He doesn't have to show a lot of patience. He wants to go play golf. He can play golf. He wants to work out. He can work out. He wants to go to a concert. He can. That's not the way it works when you're surrounded with others in the same house. And when I watched him ghost those wide receivers yesterday, I thought that was so absolutely predictable. Of course, they made mistakes. <laughs> they were small college wide receivers. They never had played in front of 60,000 people before. Forget a divisional game against the Vikings. Sometimes I feel like in the entertainment industry, musicians, actors, athletes, if they're really successful and they get rich early in their 20s, they get a little self-indulgent, a little self-absorbed, and it's hard to deal with the word no or sacrifice. I mean, it's like Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise was a rock star, like late 20s, early 30s. Suddenly, he's an expert on antidepressants. Suddenly, we have to know about his religion. It's like, dude, you're a great movie star. Be a movie star. And I find as Aaron's gotten richer 
and older. Uh, now I know what he thinks about every opinion in politics. Now I know what he thinks about our government. He's making comments to Bill Maher about the state of California. It's like, bro, I'm not a shut up and dribble guy. I'm not a stay in your lane guy. I'm really not. You actors, you guys talk about whatever you want to talk about. But I do think with Aaron, when you're successful and rich early, you don't have to sacrifice. You kind of get what you want all the time. And I think if you have young receivers, you have to understand people can't play to your standard. Aaron goes, well, what about the standard of Green Bay? Well, what about it? You're Aaron Rodgers. You can't expect a 22-year-old rookie wide receiver to play to your standard. On the road, first NFL game, Colin, Christian Watson dropped an easy touchdown. Since 2019, do you know what quarterbacks have dealt with the most drops from their receivers and tight ends? Since 2019, Tom Brady won, Josh Allen two, Patrick Mahomes three. Aaron Rodgers, 13th. He doesn't have that many drops. So occasionally, rookie wide receivers are a little over their skis. Okay, if you throw a lot, you get drops in this league. Everybody's quarterback who struggles, well, we had receivers drop the ball. Brady, Allen, Mahomes lead the NFL in drops since 2019. Do they go back to those wide receivers? Damn straight they do. You can't be petty and hold grudges during football games. Guys open, get in the rock. A big part of college football coaches' success is recruiting. A lot of these guys are not great coaches. I mean, take Nick Saban, bombed in the NFL. Steve Spurrier, bombed in the NFL. Urban Meyer, bombed in the NFL. The NFL is a coaches league. College football is different. That's why a lot of college football success stories, they're good-looking, fit men. Mel Tucker, Urban Meyer, Ryan Day. They have to walk into a house, impress mom, dad, and the kid. In the NFL, it's not exactly a runway fashion show, right? Some of these guys' hoodies, they're overweight. They look tired because you select the players. The players don't select you. And so a lot of these college coaches aren't really great coaches. Jimbo Fisher is a prime example of a guy that can recruit like nobody's business. He's not a great coach. He's not an X's and O's guy. He's a great recruiter. He can build a staff. But, you know, Saban, Spurrier, uh, Urban Meyer, they're overwhelmed by the nuances and the schemes of the NFL. It's, it's the best coaching league, the NFL. But... College isn't about coaching. That's why Lincoln Riley is different. Lincoln Riley is a decent recruiter, but he's more academic. And when I talk to my general managers and, and my people in the NFL that I've been dealing with for 10, 20 years, they all say the same thing. Lincoln Riley intellectually is at a completely different level than 99% of coaches. Um, is he a great recruiter? He's not a phony. You know, he's not somebody that's going to walk into a room and he's okay. He can play the game. But if you watch what USC is doing with Caleb Williams, I know it's Rice. I know it's Stanford. But, you know, the quarterback's completing 80% of his throws. The manipulation of personnel, the jumbo sets, the constant movement, uh, the mixing of run and pass sets. It's just different level. So, you know, when I hear the criticisms of, you know, Lincoln Riley is not a great recruiter, yeah, that's because he's actually a really good X's and O's coach. And there's a feeling right now among NFL people, there's only one or two coaches at the college level that could really walk into the NFL and schematically do really well. I mean, people, people love Matt Rule. He looks a little overwhelmed in the NFL. Spurrier, Saban, Urban Meyer, like Lou Holtz, by the way completely overwhelmed in the NFL when he coached for the Jets because Lou was a salesman, a motivational speaker. You'll find a lot of these coaches make their money in the offseason doing motivational speeches. Belichick doesn't. Andy Reid doesn't. That's not what they do. They coach. So, you know, when I look at Lincoln Riley and the, the people, the naysayers, you don't have any contacts. Like, like the people that are connected know, and they're not going to go undefeated. USC has one NFL player in their front seven defensively. They're giving up over five yards of play to Stanford and Rice. 
Fresno State's going to score on them. Uh, Utah's going to score on them. UCLA is going to score on them. Uh, hell, Arizona may score on them. They're not an undefeated roster. They're not an undefeated team. That's not what they are. You, you can only overcome so much. But what Lincoln Riley is, is really bright and really smart. And he wanted to carve out his own career. And he, he inherited Bob Stoops' culture and motivation. He wanted to do his own thing. But make no doubt about it. The, the people in the NFL, that's where the real big boy coaching is. They consider Lincoln Riley a step above the Sabans, the Jimbos, uh, I, even the Harbaugh's. And I like Jim Harbaugh. But they consider him a step above Jim in terms of schematics. 